follow. I was uh, immune, I don't know how to say it in English, but like emotional, I guess, to see all the names of those women and, you know, 16 years old and being murdered. That's appalling. Uh, so it's, but I'm very glad to be here because what's exciting about Draw the Line campaign is, is about talking about the ways we can all make a difference. So it's amazing to, to honor the volunteers who do lots of really great, amazing work. You see, run through. Draw the Line presentation. No, no, I'm about it. See, draw the line presentation right through. Down, 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 down. Up, 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 up. It's my first day. Okay. So thank you to my partner, who's from the valley here, who came to help us out. Um, yeah, so what I'm really excited about for the campaign is that it's an opportunity to educate people about what we can all do to end sexual violence in our communities, in our workplaces, in our homes, and that gets me really excited because it's really great to honor volunteers and there are tons of people doing tons of really great work who volunteer their time to make a difference. But sometimes we feel that we have to have all this training and we have to be kind of wear our special support worker hat in order to make a difference, but that's not the case at all, right? Uh, so that's what's really exciting with Draw the Line. So hopefully, uh, after my presentation, you feel a little bit more empowered to, uh, to make a difference in your own life. So, you can start now. So just to give you a little bit of context, the campaign called DrawTheLine.ca is part of Ontario's Sexual Violence Action Plan, which was put together a few years ago, and it was incredibly comprehensive. They did consultations with survivors of violence, with frontline workers, with people who write policy, uh, with a whole myriad of people to really establish, you know, Ontario wants to take sexual violence in this problem seriously, but what does that entail? And there was quite a few recommendations made, including the creation of more francophone sexual assault centers, uh, a whole myriad of things. But one of the things that kept coming up was, I'm tired of simply reacting to sexual violence. I'm tired of acting as though this is inevitable. We need to start looking at prevention. We need to start talking about things before they happen. And as we've seen in the news over the past few weeks, we get really outraged when we hear about things happening, and then a couple weeks go by, and then it happens again, and then we get angry. But our anger is not really doing us any good because it keeps happening, right? So what they did is they decided that the province of Ontario was going to have a province-wide, fully bilingual sexual violence prevention campaign that was going to try to target everybody and anybody. So it's really a first. One, as a francophone, I was quite happy to see that it was developed in English and French from the beginning. So it was not simply translated into French after the fact. It was actually engaging the Ontario Coalition of Rape Crisis Centers to develop the English portion and Action Ontarienne contre la violence faite aux femmes to develop the French portion. So it's fully bilingual. And for the first time, it's about engaging everybody. So it's not just students, it's not just on campuses, it's not just in workplaces. It's a campaign with six scenarios that seem to address six types of sexual violence along the spectrum. And it uses really accessible language and really accessible mediums so that you don't have to be in this field to actually hear the message. Because oftentimes what happens, for those of us who do this work, uh, is we speak to ourselves. And we love that, right? Because it's safe. We don't really get challenged on it. We get a lot of nods of like, yes, I agree with you. And then we're like, okay, well, these people don't need to hear my message, right? If I go to an event and I know everybody there, it's a really great party, but I'm not really making a difference because those people don't need to hear the message, right? So we, we were like, okay, we've got to be honest about the fact that we've got to reach everybody and everybody because if we say sexual violence affects everyone, then why are we not targeting everyone in our messaging? So we launched last year, so May is Sexual Assault Awareness Month. I'm really tall and I'm standing in front of the, of the screen, so I'm very sorry. <laughs> Try to reach around. I can see people like, and I'm French, so I talk with my hands, so that doesn't help either. Um, so yes, yeah, so we launched last year in May of 2012 for Sexual Assault Awareness Month. And in launching the campaign, what we also decided to do was to have a Draw the Line Day. So the third Tuesday of every May will be Draw the Line Day, where we're going to be kind of highlighting particular scenarios in the campaign. This year, what's really exciting is that for this year's Draw the Line Day, which is happening May 21st, we're also going to be announcing some people who got some Phase 2 funding who are going to take the campaign that exists and adapt it, including translations in over 30 languages, which is really exciting, including ASL. Uh, it's really going to be quite exciting to see the campaign kind of adapted. So look for that in May. So what's the premise of the campaign? Well, what we're doing is we're wanting to engage bystanders. So if you're kind of academic or maybe a super nerdy person, you'll be really into this giant definition that we have. And the reason why we give it is because some campaigns have very specific definitions of bystander, 
which is that you have to know the person in order to want to engage in making a difference. And we use what is referred to as academically the Lori Haskell definition. But basically from our perspective, unless you're the person being targeted or the person perpetrating, you are a bystander. I don't need to know you to make a difference in your life if I see something that you're experiencing. That's our philosophy. But what that means is that we might also be targeting survivors themselves. So I might be a survivor seeing something happen to someone else. Therefore, the message that you tell me about how to intervene has to, has to recognize the fact that I might not feel safe to intervene. So you can't just tell me one thing to do. We have to give people a list of things to do because it might not be safe for me to do something, but I want to, but it doesn't feel safe for me to do that. Does that make sense? Okay. Also, what's quite interesting about being here this week is this year's theme for National Victims of Crime Week is what is your role? And so I think that's really important for me and in the work that we do is to really recognize the role that everybody has in making a difference in all the spaces in which they live in, right? So not just if I go to work and I see sexual harassment in the workplace, but if I'm in Ottawa, and right now with lots of stuff that's been going on in the media about taking transit, right? I'm taking the bus and I see somebody uh, being inappropriate to somebody else. I have a role to play there. I might not know that person. I might be on my way to work but it's still my responsibility to make a difference in that moment. So the premise of the campaign is, what would you do if you saw something? Would you do something? And if you would, what would that be? So as a sexual assault public educator, I will go into schools and I'll say, I'm here to talk about sexual violence. And everyone will say, yeah, boo. Boo, sexual violence, bad. Nope, don't do that. Don't know anyone who does, it's bad. Not a fan, right? But someone is doing this stuff, right? And I talk to a lot of people. And if one in four women are being sexually assaulted, and if the average perpetrator, when they are actually arrested, have typically assaulted up to six other people, that's people who are assaulting people that I'm probably interacting with, but either are not taking accountability or have no idea that what they're doing is sexual assault, right? So as a community, as a society, we have these values that we claim to hold, right? So on the one hand, we say, we don't stand for violence, we respect women, we respect our communities, but then we have our actions which don't always match up. So what we're doing in our campaign is we're asking people, okay, it's easy for you to say, well, I wouldn't have done that in that situation, right? And those of us who support survivors of sexual violence, we hear that all the time, right? Survivors of sexual violence are blamed over and over and over again. People say they would have done differently if they were them. There's a lot of judgment. So what we're saying is fine, since you're the expert, Here's a scenario, what are you gonna do about it, right? So that's the premise of our campaign. And I'll go through six of the scenarios, two in particular, I'll take a little bit of time to kind of deconstruct a little bit with you, but you'll see in going through them that we're telling a story without using pictures, and that's purposeful, the language is very accessible, and we're not telling people what the right answer is. And the reason why we're doing that is because when you're working with youth, you can create that model of uh, kind of the model of the person you want to be, right? But if I'm targeting a middle-aged man and I'm telling him what he should or shouldn't be doing, he's not listening to me because he thinks he's got it all figured out, right? So when we tell people what the answer is, they get defensive, right? They're not listening because they think, I'm, you know, I'm not 14 anymore, you can't tell me what to do, right? So what we're saying is, okay, what would you do? Would you do this or would you do that? I'm not telling you what the right answer is, but I'm just going to tell you what I would do in that situation. So we'll start off with the first scenario. Your favorite singer assaulted his girlfriend. Do you download his latest single? So you can see here there's no pictures of people. And that was purposeful so that, one, we don't have triggering imagery. right? We don't have images of people being abused, which if I'm seeing that might be triggering some, some negative emotions for me. And I don't need 100 posters with 100 faces to represent the diversity of Ontario. So it doesn't matter who you are you can see yourself reflected in that scenario. Now this particular scenario always kind of cracks me up only because when we were doing focus groups, the older crowd said, well, this poster is really boring. It's like really white, it's kind of me, you know. And then we went into high schools and they said, oh yeah, they're supposed to look like iTunes. I get that, that totally looks like my, when I, when I download music. So what's interesting is this might resonate more with some people than other people, but you still, you can still get the message and you can still sort of think about what you would do. Now, I've gone into schools and had this one scenario last an hour-long discussion with people who at the beginning of the hour said, yeah, whatever, I download the music. There's a difference between the artist and the person. 
And then other people will say, well, really? And then by the end of the hour, they're like, well, maybe I should, yeah, maybe that's not a good thing to do. Maybe if, maybe if this is something I believe in, then I shouldn't put money in the pockets of people who perpetuate this, right? And what they realized is that if we want to end sexual assault, right, at this end of the spectrum, then we need to start talking about the things that we allow every day that create an environment in which suddenly it's okay to sexually assault someone. Right? So next slide. Your wasted friend staggers out of the bar with some guy. Do you stay and keep dancing? Now, if you go on the website, which I highly encourage you to do, or also on social media, uh, what happens on the website is you vote. In order to get it deeper into the website, you have to say yes or no to every question. This question, so we've been around for almost a year now, this question still, 75% of people say they would stay and keep dancing. Which means 75% of people are not aware that you cannot consent to sexual activity when intoxicated. 75% of people don't know that alcohol is the number one date rape drug. And 75% of people are more concerned about interrupting someone's hookup than they are in protecting someone from being sexually assaulted. This particular scenario has also been downloaded five times more than any other scenario on the site. So there's a lot, of, and, and anyone who's been following the news over the past few weeks, we have seen this. We've seen women at parties who are sexually assaulted, photos are taken, the whole, and it's all of this idea of, well, she shouldn't have been drinking so much, right? So once again, we're telling a story, you know, kind of looks like a club, and it's very simple, very easy to read, and it's getting people thinking about, you know, if I said, yeah, I would stay and keep dancing, well, what does that say about the so-called values that you said you had? And what kind of friend are you to leave somebody behind? Right? And what we hear is people think, no, I'm being a good friend. I'm not interrupting their hookup. I'm, I'm letting them be. And we're saying, no, that's not the right message. That's not actually being a good friend to someone. Make sense? The coach spends extra time with the player on and off the field. So this one here, I thought it was supposed to look like a basketball. Clearly, I'm not a hockey fan. It was supposed to look like a hockey jersey. <laughs> I thought it was basketball. But either way, sport-like. <laughs> Clearly I'm not very athletic. Uh, so this scenario here when we developed it last year was very timely because we developed a campaign around the Penn State case that was happening in the United States where uh, young boys were being sexually assaulted by a coach and where there was a community that for a long time had a lot of whispers about this coach being inappropriate, them isolating players, but no one wanted to start a rumor, right? And what we kept hearing was people were more concerned about starting a rumor than they were about protecting children that were being sexually assaulted for long periods of time. And when the story finally came through and there was an arrest made, there was outrage that people didn't do anything. And yet the people who were involved said, well, I just didn't have enough to go on. So I didn't really want to hurt his feelings and make him look bad. And nobody wants that kind of accusation. But our, you know, from our perspective, if a lot of people are talking about something, there's probably a reason for it. And anyone who does coach, anyone who coaches, teachers and parents, they know that there are precautions that you can take, there are measures you can take so that you're never alone with players. So if you're a male coach and coaching girls teams, that you always have a, you know, an assistant coach or you always have a parent present. I mean, there are things that you can do to protect yourself from accusations. So that's not what this is about, right? This is about us protecting the wrong people and defending the wrong people. Who was defending those children at Penn State? Who was defending Ray Parsons in Nova Scotia, right? Who was defending Amanda Todd? That's the conversation we're wanting to have, which is people need to stop being so afraid about, well, how bad is it gonna make me look? When, you know, that's our priority. One, how are we, we're not protecting those children, and two, what message are we sending those children as well, right? This one here, so a friend sends you a naked picture of a girl he knows, is it a big deal to share it with others? Now, for those of you who are kind of techie, you can see it's kind of the Facebook online um, discussion. This, I could go, and I'm not exaggerating, I could be in schools twice a day for the next five years only talking about this issue, and there are still schools that would be hungry for me to come back and talk about it again. Schools, it doesn't matter where you are, rural, urban, English, French, public, Catholic, they are struggling with this issue in their own schools. We've seen it in the media over the past few weeks, where it keeps happening and it keeps happening. And from our perspective, the messages that we send are wrong, and that all we're saying is to young girls, don't take a picture because people will use it against you. And what, we, what I want to know is, where's the conversation about the person who decided it was funny to send it to their hockey team? Where's the conversation about the person who decided to post it online? Right? That's the conversation we want to have. 
Um, it's a separate conversation. When two people send consensual photos to each other, that's a separate issue than what we're talking about here. What happened to Ray Parsons was not consensual in any way, shape, or form, right? She was sexually assaulted. Someone took her photo and circulated it. To just tell people not to take photos is telling women not to take photos and send them to someone else. So for us, it was really important to have that conversation about bystanders, about why is it that we dehumanize women so much that it's funny to send pictures of them to other people to laugh at them. Uh, and then when, we, when the scandal comes out, the conversation is, well, she shouldn't have had her photo taken, right? Which is forgetting that oftentimes those photos were not taken consensually, and even if they were, uh, if you're under the age of 18, it's child pornography. Right? It's a distribution of child pornography, even if yourself are under the age of 18. So one, there are legal repercussions to this, but two, it stopped being consensual when you decided to press reply all and send it to everybody in your classroom. Right? So schools are struggling, and we're glad to be here to have the conversation, um, but this is an issue that we, we haven't figured out yet, and we're not going to get anywhere if we just keep being appalled every time it happens, but not actually you know, making a difference. So when I go into schools, I say, you know, someone sends you that picture, delete it. It's really not that hard. Just delete the photo. If you know the person in the photo, tell them. Did you know that your photo is circulating? Because I got a picture of it, and I didn't ask you for it, right? Simple, simple things that young people need to hear, but they're not hearing because we prefer to be in denial about the fact that our young people are doing this, right? And what we're saying is, once again, that denial is re-victimizing other people. You hear your, your boss tell a coworker how great her legs look in a skirt? Do you go back to your desk? Now, two things about this one. One, I remember the iTunes question where the young people were like, oh, I totally get it. And then the older crowd was like, this is boring, right? The amount of young people who said, uh, there's a spelling mistake on your poster. And I was like, no, it's because it's, it's supposed to look like a typewriter. And they were like, well, can't you just backspace on the typewriter? Like, why'd you have to put the white stuff? And then I was like, it's white out. And the amount of people who didn't know what white out was made me cry. <laughs> so, <laughs> Again, even if you have no idea why there's a white <laughs> spelling mistake on it, right? You still get the scenario, it still makes sense to you, right? But it's still speaking to, um, you know, maybe a specific crowd, right? This scenario has also been on the website for almost a year. And to this day, if you go on right now, it's still at almost 50-50. And what's really interesting is people recognize this sexual harassment in the workplace, but people are, they know or they fear that if they say something, there will be repercussions against them. And so what that tells me is that we've done a lot of education in the 80s and 90s. We did a lot of cover. We had a lot of really productive conversations about sexual harassment in the workplace. You know, starting with Anita Hill in the U.S. You know, this started this firestorm of conversation, which is great. A lot of workplaces have training that their that their employees have to undertake. They have posters they have to put up to tell people about their rights. But there hasn't been a cultural shift in order to defend the people who come forward to say, "I witnessed this" or "This happened to me." And so as work, not just as employers, but as colleagues and as employees, it's important for us to recognize that workplace sexual harassment is not necessarily about two people, but it's about a toxic work environment. It's about an environment where I don't feel safe enough to come forward and say, this person is being inappropriate to me, or this person is being inappropriate to my colleague, and I don't feel safe to come forward, even though that person might be outnumbered. I mean, there might be one person in the workplace who's single-handedly creating a toxic environment for everybody. And yet, there's more of us than them, but the environment is so hostile and toxic that we don't feel like we can say something. So that's what this message tells me. One, it's great when I go in and talk to people and they say, yeah, absolutely, this is not okay. But the fact that 50% of people still wouldn't feel comfortable saying something concerns me and means we still have a lot of work to do. So what we mean by sexual, uh, sexual harassment in the workplace, well, is, is it going to over here? So this is the kind of stuff we do to sort of flesh out for people what we mean by sexual harassment. Because we didn't give an obvious example. And we really toyed with that for a while about, you know, making a compliment about someone's appearance. Right? It's on the line for some people, right? But that's why we purposely use that example. Because what we also wanted to do was not make it so obvious that people answered what they thought was the right answer versus what they actually thought themselves they would do, right? So we wanted to really make it clear to people that it's not just touching someone but then it's also sending inappropriate emails and pictures, right? People sending forwards with nudity or inappropriate videos in the workplace to people to kind of intimidate them. Um, making jokes in the workplace. You know, oftentimes when we hear about sexual harassment, someone will say something and then say, oh, well, I was just kidding, or, 
you know, but it's like, well, you seem to be kidding about this issue a lot, right? <laughs> and so you seem to only be joking about it once I got offended. Um, comments, and even things like leering, you know, staring people up and down, just making people feel uncomfortable in their workplace where they have a right to be and to feel safe. So this is what we tell people. First of all, only ever do what's safe for you in that moment and overall, right? So one, you can call out the person, kind of an angry, loudmouth human being. So I would be that person to be like, I see you, you are gross, you need to stop doing that, right? But that's me, and that might not be you, right? <laughs> and maybe the person who made the comment is your boss, right? Maybe it's not just the person that you have share a cubicle with. Maybe it's someone who, you know, signed your paycheck. So maybe it's not safe to do that. So you can call HR, right? The wonderful human resources people who, um, you know, can be your backup, can be your ally in saying, maybe I said something and nothing happened, or I don't feel comfortable saying something, so can you help me say something to our employer, to that person, uh, you know, get some backup. <clears throat> And a simple thing that you can do is just check in with the person who's been, who's been targeted. Right? So if I'm sitting in my cube and I saw somebody say something to, say some, to someone else, the least I can do is go up to that person and say, just so you know, I saw that, that was really gross and really inappropriate and I'm really sorry that happened to you. Are you okay? Do you want me to call HR? Maybe, maybe you know that person and maybe this is an inside joke and I don't know the context. Maybe there's, maybe there's something going on there that I don't know. But there's no harm in telling someone, I saw what happened, I'm really sorry, is there something I can do? That is, this, that is so simple, there's no harm in doing that, and maybe that person's like, oh no, no, no worries, it's, it's an inside joke, it's a thing we're talking about, like, no, that's no big deal, right? And maybe it is no big deal. But you made it known that you saw it, that it was not okay by you, and therefore that you're not gonna tolerate seeing that again, right? Simple, simple. There's no reason why you can't do that, again, right? <coughs> so we gave one last example. Your sister tells you that her husband made her have sex last night. Do you change the subject? So, a few things. As a support worker to victims and survivors of sexual assault, I can tell you that the first person that someone discloses to, how they react dictates whether or not I tell anyone else ever again. So if I tell you and you react badly, then you just told me that I ain't never going to tell anybody else ever again. Right? And so I support women who were sexually assaulted 30 years ago and it's the first time they're saying something about it because they told one person and that person's message to them was, yeah, you don't want to talk about this ever again, right? So if you're the first person that someone discloses to you and you react supportively, then you've just told that person, okay, I'm an ally, I'm someone who's gonna listen to you, right? And this scenario, again, we purposely use something that was subtle um, because oftentimes what happens is people will just kind of give you a little crumb to see how you react and then if you react supportively, then they're gonna tell you the whole story, right? So maybe I'll just tell you the story in passing, like, oh yeah, I was, you know, I'm just a little off today because this happened yesterday. And maybe what I really wanna do is sob to you and tell you that this happens all the time, but I'm just testing the waters to see how you react, right? And oftentimes these things are awkward, right? Maybe you just went over to have some coffee or you just came over to borrow something or, you know, to pick up your kids or whatever and this person discloses to you and it's awkward or you don't have the time for it but it's important for us to be there to support people. And if this is a value we have, then these are the actions we need to take. Okay. So, this question in particular was important for us because the amount of people, I was a TA for Intro to Women's Studies many years ago when I did my undergrad at Carleton, and the amount of people in women's studies who did not know that it was illegal to sexually assault your wife was shocking. However, it only became illegal in this country in the 80s. That's pretty shocking, right? So this is just a graph to kind of show you where marital rape, as it's defined, became a crime. And for many people, it was only in the early 2000s. So no wonder we have a lot of work to do, because even the legal system only recognized it fairly recently. Okay. So your sister discloses to you, you don't know what to do. Once again, do what feels right for you. But first, just support that person and listen to them. Right? Just be, maybe all they want to do is throw up that story on somebody because it's been weighing on them for way too long. Right? That's all they want to hear, it's just for you to, to, to hear them. And believe them. I cannot emphasize enough how survivors and victims of sexual violence internalize the messages that we give them, which is that you are to blame and no one will believe you. And particularly in the context of a domestic relationship, how many people talk about sexual assault by their own partner? Very few people, right? 
And the stories we do hear are the sensationalized stories, as I was saying about in Nova Scotia, Amanda Todd, and Steubenville, Penn State. We hear about these huge cases of stranger assault, and yet 80 to 95% of people are assaulted by someone they know, right? So for you to say to them, I believe you, I cannot emphasize enough how huge that is for people. People will come and see me for 20 weeks, an hour, every week for 20 weeks, and all I tell them basically for an hour is, I believe you. What happened to you was wrong, and I'm sorry that happened to you. And you have no idea the power those words have for people because we have all these messages that tell us we need to question our own behavior rather than the behavior of people who perpetrated against us. And you are not expected to be a psychologist, a support worker, a counselor, a social worker. That expectation is not put on you by me or by anyone else, right? But you can refer them to any of the great services that you've heard about here today, right? If you go to our website, for example, there's a section where you, it says, it happened to me for each scenario. So if you see yourself reflected in the scenarios, you can click on that. There's also a section on each scenario that says, it happened to someone I know, right? So if you see the bar question and you're like, that was my friend, that was totally my friend, that's what happened to my friend and I want to support her. There's information about where you can go, and not just in uh, you know, this community, but anywhere in the province of Ontario. There's a little dot on a map that will tell you where your closest sexual assault center is. And you refer them to it. And that's all you have to do. It's so simple. Tell people you believe them. Ask them what they need and refer them to services. And I'm telling you, the change that will make in, your, in that person's life and the ripple effect in the community is astounding. And it's really not that hard. In short, be a decent human being. <laughs> this is really what I tell people. People think that, I'm gonna, that they have to take notes on like, the specific things they have to do. And I'm like, just believe them. And be a good person. It's really not that hard. Um, and just know that the message that, that we hear all the time, everybody internalizes that, including people who've been sexually assaulted themselves, right? So if someone was sexually assaulted and photos were taken and their life was in the news and we still didn't believe them, then who's going to believe little old me in my home when I tell you my husband sexually assaulted me, right? I mean, it makes sense. Of course people would think that. I would think that, right? And I do this work. So just knowing that if you see something, there are tangible things that you can do um, I feel is an empowering message for people to hear. And to me, you know, if I'm going to hear about five stories about women taking their own lives because they've been sexually assaulted, I I've reached my breaking point. I don't know about y'all, but I cannot hear about one more person taking their own life or being murdered. I'm done. Not taking it anymore. <laughs> Can't take it, right? So if you're interested in the campaign, the Renfrew, uh, the folks in Renfrew have material. I have brought you material at the back. So all of, in terms of the tangibles, we have a website, as I said, social media. Every day for the month of May, Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we're going to be posting a new scenario every single day. Um, so the six scenarios, but a total of 27. So if you're interested, if you want to hop on Facebook or Twitter and follow us, all kinds of scenarios that talk about elder abuse, that talk about abuse against people with disabilities, that talk about homophobic sexual violence, uh, that talk about a whole ton of stuff, to get a conversation going for at least one month, if we can get people thinking about the ways that they can make a difference in their community, pretty huge. The great thing is, is all the material is totally free. 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 So when I went into campuses and I tried to get them on board, they were like, eee, when I was like, it's free, all of a sudden, they were really excited. <laughs> so there's postcards that have the scenario on the front and all the ways you can intervene on the back, and I have those at the back for each six scenario, and there's posters for a bunch of the scenarios as well that you can put up. Um, and like I said, if you go on the website, you can get people to vote. There's still a lot of work we got to do. You know, 75% of people are leaving their friends behind. 50% of people are not doing anything in the workplace. There's a lot of stuff to do. But the hope is, is the more people have conversations about this and the more we start thinking about sexual violence as a spectrum, rather than just sexual violence equals rape, um, then we can actually start making a difference and we can hear about more exciting things in the news rather than young women taking their own lives because they're not being listened to. So, um, as I said, here's all the information if you want to get in touch with us, uh, if you want us to come into your schools, if you want us to come into your workplace. I can also hook you up with all the French information. So if you're, if you're a francophone and you're looking for the website, it's called Traçant les Limites. Um, so the same website, uh, and it's info at Traçant les Limites if you want to request the French material as well. But I thank you all very much for being here and very attentive. And I hope that you're feeling a little bit more empowered to do something rather than simply being kind of depressed by the reality that it's happening, because it is depressing and we need to acknowledge that. But I really feel like we need to channel that into really tangible, productive ways that we can actually expect a better tomorrow for our young people um, and for the people that are still here. So thank you so much. Thank you.